Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to preface this by saying that this is a, this story is a little bit of a downer, but, um, you know, it's, it's been, it's been an interesting, um, process with this one because I started writing it probably over a year ago and I just finished it this week. Um, mostly because I was unsure how to finish the thing. Um, and that's where I'm at. So, uh, just so you know, anyway, <clears throat> title of this is, um, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody's, hmm? all right, excellent. The title of this is <clears throat> A Selfie with Snugglepuff. When Snugglepuff died, she had 7,257 fo followers on Instagram, 5,890 friends on Facebook, 2,145 followers on Tumblr, and 554 followers on Snapchat. Janine was very drunk, so drunk that she had been asked to leave the sushi bar. They called her an Uber, told her she could pick up her car and pay her tab in the morning, then hustled her out the back door. She had forgotten <clears throat> what she had done or said that made them throw her out, but as, as she weaved around by the dumpster holding back vomit, she spotted something in the shadows that looked like a living piece of greasy trash. She threw up spreading chewed California roll and sake bomb onto the sidewalk. Janine pulled a large stack of napkins from her purse and wiped her mouth. The little trash thing cautiously sidled over and began laughing at the pool of vomit. Janine could see that somewhere under the matted fur, motor oil, and other trash, it was a dog. She leaned down, unstable on her tall wedge sandals, and held out her hand. The little thing walked through the puddle of sick and sniffed at Janine's fingers. A bright pink tongue flopped over a toothy smile, and Janine couldn't help but scratch it on the head. Her Uber arrived, and without thinking, she grabbed the little dog and stuffed it into the canvas tote bag she always carried. It squirmed and snarled a bit, but it didn't bark or try to bite. Steve, a blue Corolla. The ride home was quick and wordless. She put the little dog in her bathroom <clears throat> and shut the door, then went to the kitchen and rummaged through her fridge to find something for the thing to eat. She came back with some slices of Swiss cheese and a few strips of pre-cooked bacon. The dog had already pissed on the floor. Janine threw a towel on it. She took off her clothes and used the cheese and bacon to lure the dog into the shower. It was calmer than she expected, and she was able to scrub the layer of oily filth out of the fur, though some of the thicker mats would have to be cut out. When dry, she was a scraggly white puff with black eyes and nose, and a long pink tongue that hung out almost to the floor. It was unmistakably cute, but there was something off about the dog, almost unsettling, as if it was defective, like something awful had happened to it in the past, or it was just somehow unbelievably stupid. She took the dog to bed, laid it down on the at the foot of her comforter, panting and drooling. The room was spinning a bit. Janine was feeling her drunk wear off and her hangover coming on. She reached for her phone and opened Instagram, snapped a photo of the dog and typed, so I met someone great tonight. Look at this perfect little hashtag snuggle puff, hashtag love at first sight. She slept badly, her phone constantly beeping and buzzing, the notification light filling her room with blue-green glow. She opened her phone and the brightness of the screen made her eyes and brain throb unpleasantly. And she was slammed by messages. One, did you get home okay? From Kayla, the friend she had met at the sushi bar, but dozens more asked about the adorable new puppy in the picture. She turned off her phone, still had a hard time falling asleep. When the morning sun started to show through her curtains, she gave up, put on a bathrobe, grabbed the little dog in her arms and took it outside for a moment. When she came back, she turned on her phone again and found that the picture she had posted the night before had been liked by 153 people, which was nearly a hundred more than her next most popular post, the bathing suit selfie she had taken on the boat in Ibiza during a vacation with her dad and his latest wife three years ago. Since then, nothing on her page had broken 50 likes and she posted at least one thing every day, usually lunch or coffee or a cocktail, and sometimes her own face when she felt good about it. 
Janine looked at the photo of the scraggly little white dog and tapped <clears throat> to see the list of names of people who had tapped to give their approval. Most of them were from her 200 or so followers, but 20 of them were people she didn't know. Janine was hazy and hungover and wasn't sure how to feel. In the week that followed, Janine took the dog to the vet and to the groomer. The name Snugglepuff stuck, mainly because she needed to give a name to the vet, and she had used the hashtag a few times. Snugglepuff was calm and well-mannered, though she tended to let out loud, gooey sneezes and had a voracious appetite for human food, a remnant of her life on the streets. Unlike most of the small dogs Janine knew, Snugglepuff did not yap or bark, though when something scared her enough, she would freeze, shake, and then pee, no matter where she was or what position she was in. Snugglepuff was quickly incorporated into almost every aspect of Janine's daily life. She took the dog to work and to the grocery store <clears throat> and out to the bars and cafes. At the same time, Snugglepuff became the sole focus of Janine's online persona, with photos and videos taking over all four of the social media sites that Janine used frequently. There was, another, there was an otherworldly quality to the dog, something easy to see but hard to pin down, something uncanny. Most dogs are very expressive. Most of their thoughts and feelings telegraphed in their faces and small movements of the muscles around the eyes. But Snugglepuff was unreadable, a cipher, the Mona Lisa of Pomeranians. At one moment, she would seem calmly lost in thought, but suddenly her eyes would empty out and she would appear unimaginably stupid, almost like a doll, except for the panting breaths and the long pink tongue that flopped down to reach the floor. She was irresistibly photogenic, and soon Janine started a new Instagram account dedicated exclusively to Snugglepuff the Pom Pom. It grew slowly at first with only a few friends following, but within a month, Snugglepuff had over 500 followers, most of which had never heard of Janine Wells, but who knew Snugglepuff the Pomeranian. Soon, Snugglepuff developed into a minor celebrity, and Janine began to put it to good use. First, she appeared on city benches at bus stops in an ad for Janine's real estate services. An invitation to appear on a local morning talk show soon followed. Janine rebranded everything for her business to feature the quizzical, vacant face of Snugglepuff. It worked almost too well and Janine was quickly overwhelmed with the number of calls and emails and website visits. Almost one third of them were pe people seeking her services. The rest were people who wanted to meet Snugglepuff, and some, some of them said they were willing to pay. And then she died. Janine came home to find Snugglepuff keeled over with her face half submerged in a puddle of vomited chocolate. Somehow she had gotten to the large Toblerone candy bar that Janine had left in the center of the kitchen counter. Janine had always assumed that the counter was too high and she had no idea how Snugglepuff got to the candy bar. She called the vet who asked if the dog had, still had a pulse. Janine checked, it didn't. Most likely, the vet said, she ate the chocolate. That made her vomit. Then she choked on the vomit. I'm very sorry for your loss. Janine was more panicked than anything else. Snugglepuff was dead and worst, Janine felt it was her fault. She took the body, still pristine, but for some chocolate stains around the nose and mouth and a general sniff stiffness, and put it in a plastic grocery bag, then stuffed it into her freezer, intending to give Snugglepuff a proper burial at a later time. She cleaned up the vomited Toblerone, then picked up her phone and opened Instagram. She picked out the first photo she had ever taken of Snugglepuff at the foot of her bed that first night and started to type a caption. 18 months ago, my life changed forever when this little angel found me when I needed her most. Now, with a heavy heart, I have to report that Snugglepuff unexpectedly crossed the Rainbow Bridge earlier today. She stopped there. She couldn't finish the post. She backspaced and canceled posting. Janine felt sick and went to lie down. A dark mood swept over her, a spiral of anxiety that wouldn't let go. She looked at the comments, the followers, and the silent but satisfying glowing red heart graphics under every picture of the dog that was at the moment wedged into the freezer between the ice maker and a stack of miniature frozen pizzas. 
Janine tried to cry. She didn't really feel like crying, but thought that it was what she was supposed to do in the situation. Her hands shook, her heart rattled irregularly, and she had a hard time breathing. She felt grief for the dog, but the grief was overpowered by something else, a feeling that had no name, but that took the form of a steady stream of imagined hatred coming from a thousand different directions. She could see the messages already. She felt could see the angry face icons under the clickbait articles that described Snugglepuff's untimely death by chocolate. Janine wanted a name to go with the feeling. She took out her phone and searched. What is the opposite of schadenfreude? Fremdscham, a feeling of vicarious embarrassment for someone else's misfortune. No, that was wrong. That's not what experiencing that's not what experiencing rather the sinking feeling that one is in imminent danger of becoming the subject of schadenfreude don't the germans have a word for that they seem to have a word for everything else she opened her phone's notepad app and started typing she wasn't sure exactly what to say but she knew she had to say something maybe just to buy some time maybe Hey guys, it's me. I want you all to know that I love you all so much, but me and hashtag Snugglepuff have decided we need to step away from social media for a while. We're both going on a bit of a cleanse, but don't worry. We'll be back before you know it. Thank you all for your love and your support. Please respect our privacy at this time. She posted the message to Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook and attached an archived picture of Snugglepuff wearing a little white sailor's cap. Part two. Janine had never thought of herself as addicted to social media or to her phone or to the attention those things provided. However, in the two weeks she spent away, she felt an almost constant twitching, a low itch in her thumbs and in her eyes that sometimes grew into something almost unbearable. The silence of her phone kept her awake at night, and the feeling of disconnection grew louder every day. Janine stopped going out, stopped seeing friends, and the work for Janine Wells Realty LLC dried up a little bit. Snugglepuff remained stuffed next to some frozen pizzas that Janine would never eat. Every time she opened the freezer, she looked at Snugglepuff's staring back at her and saw the faded smear of chocolate around her mouth. She considered her crime, her irresponsibility, her stupidity, and <clears throat> it hurt. It hurt a lot. Uh, she knew that people in her life, she knew that people in her life, the people she worked with, the people in the coffee shop downstairs from her condo, the friends she hadn't seen in a while were all wondering about her and talking about her. They were wondering about Snugglepuff, wondering where they both were. She mostly avoided people, but whenever somebody asked, she would just tell them that the attention was getting to be too much, both for her and for the dog. The lying was easy for her. She didn't think of it as lying, but as discretion. Everyone doesn't need to know everything, Janine. She remembered her father telling her when she was a kid. Janine's moods became dark, and she started to drink more than she was used to. The secret in her freezer became louder every day. Dad, she said to her father's voicemail. He never picked up the phone unless he was expecting the call. And Janine had called suddenly one afternoon after almost finishing a bottle of sweet, cheap rosé. Dad, I'm scared. Please call me back. I did something bad, something really bad, and I don't know what to do. Roy Wells was a problem solver. He had never been very good at much else. Whenever anyone came to him with anything, his first and only instinct was to search for some way to fix whatever was wrong. It didn't always work, and most of the time, the people around him would rather have him sympathize or just say, I'm so sorry, even if he didn't mean it. But he was never able to do that. Janine understood most of the time. <clears throat> she was the only one, most of the time, and she was the only one who did understand. His way of showing love was to find out what he could buy, what favors he could call in. Whenever anyone was in any kind of distress, his only reaction was, how can I fix this? Or what does it cost? Roy came into a Janine's apartment with a clear plastic bag. Janine specifically planned it this way. She didn't want to be at home when it happened. 
Roy snapped on two latex gloves, brought over from his dermatology practice, opened the freezer and stuffed Snugglepuff's frozen corpse into the bag, then put that bag into his brown leather briefcase. He then cleared everything else out of the freezer, put it all in the garbage bag, then left. He was in the apartment for less than 10 minutes. Then he sent Janine a text message. Done. You can go home now. Part three. Janine stood in the post office line holding her peach colored cl claim slip, waiting. She hated the post office. It seemed to her like a dusty relic of the past, something that should have been automated by now. She'd left her phone in her car and didn't even miss it, really. Since Snugglepuff's death, Janine had pulled away from a lot of things. She still talked to friends and sent messages back and forth, but she had deleted most of the apps from her phone and completely stopped liking and commenting. It wasn't as difficult as she thought it would be, and the effects were pleasant and unexpected. Still, there was a nagging anxiety, largely because she had promised that Snugglepuff would be back to frolic across thousands of small screens again. She felt guilty for disappearing, but felt better about so much more. She presented the slip and signed for the package. There was no return address, and she had no idea what it could be. She opened it in the car by slicing, <clears throat> by slicing down the packing tape with one of her keys. There was a card on top, the, ty the, the type that comes in bulk stationary sets. No words, just a picture of some roses. Janine, I'm so sorry for your loss. I know how much you loved this little guy, and I wish I could make this easier for you. This is the best I could do. I have a patient who does this sort of thing. I think he did a great job too. Very lifelike. With love, Dr. Roy Wells. Janine recognized the fur that peeked up through the wrappings of pink tissue paper. She was a little disgusted and afraid to go deeper into the package. She took it home and put it on the counter, the same kitchen counter where Snugglepuff had died, and pulled the wrapped furry lump out of the box. It was, <clears throat> it was, as her father had written, very lifelike, filled with soft stuffing material like a teddy bear, and there was a, wi a wire armature inside to allow it to be bent into different positions. Janine saw her reflection in the glass eyes, and for a moment it felt like Snugglepuff was alive and well again. Without thinking, she pulled out her phone, held the stuffed dog up to her cheek, and snapped a photo. The fur of the now inanimate Pomeranian felt just like it had when the dog was alive, but the body was slightly floppy and a few degrees too cold. But the photo was perfect. In the picture, Snugglepuff seemed just as she had been before, no more or less full of life. She had never looked especially smart or awake. Snugglepuff Snugglepuff's eyes always had that flat quality of the eyes of a shark. The glass replicas were even more accurate than the taxidermist probably knew. Janine stared at the photo, let the screen burn it into her brain. She zoomed into every detail, inspected every pixel. As far as she could tell, it was flawless. Her heart was beating hard as the Instagram app downloaded onto her phone again. Then, as she opened her account, then she clicked <clears throat> the plus sign icon, opened the photo of herself with the preserved corpse of Snugglepuff, applied the Mayfair filter, typed, hey guys, we're back, and posted. Janine sat on her couch with her phone in her hand, waiting for the fallout. She closed Instagram, laid down her phone, tried not to think about it, but then immediately opened the app again. There was a small sense of relief when the first little red hearts appeared under the photo. She thought she would be caught, that someone among Snugglepuff's thousands of followers would be able to tell that she was holding a stuffed skin instead of the animal they all loved. But as the likes and encouraging comments piled up, it became clear that no one could tell the difference. In some ways, Snugglepuff was even more photogenic in death than she had been in life. The soft-mounted body with its inner wire armature could be positioned in a variety of ways. She no longer resisted hats or other outfits, and the face was frozen into Snugglepuff's trademark quizzical stare. Janine could take her time with the photographs now, meticulously post posing and framing the shots. So much was left to chance when Snugglepuff was alive. She would lose interest or need to go outside and would have to be coaxed with treats every step of the way. Janine kept the stuffed body in a cedar box <clears throat> under her nightstand. 
she stopped having people over, stopped going to the coffee shop downstairs, but still people stopped her on her way in or out of the building or at work and asked her about Snugglepuff. Janine continued the easy lie and would tell them that Snugglepuff's vet had said public attention was far too stressful. This lie had a double effect of covering for, for the dog's absence while also making people feel bad for asking about it. It allowed Janine to cut off further questions, then direct inquisitive fans to follow her social media accounts if they wanted to stay up to date on how Snugglepuff was doing. I'm not sure how to end this story. I don't want to punish Janine. I don't want to turn this into a fable about the condition of our time. Nothing so simple as a screed against the fakery of social media and the ways our technology-centered lives force people into elaborate performances to make their lives look a certain way. Or I could get into the Skinner box feedback loop of likes and comments and how the reward systems of our current reality are slowly turning us all into monstrous caricatures and hungry ghosts. And I could try to infuse some oversimplified moral about unplugging and living a more genuine life away from our screens out there in the real world. But to do that would just make us feel good for a moment, temporarily indulge our confirmation bias and we could take some comfort in being people who would never do something so weird and gross. But the truth is, none of us knows how weird and gross we can get. We don't know the depth of our grief, the depth of our loneliness. So we will leave on an image. Janine Wells, 34-year-old real estate agent, sitting cross-legged in the center of her bed, wearing an oversized Guayabara shirt, powder blue with white embroidery and flannel pajamas, pink with a pattern of black silhouettes of standing Pomeranians in profile. Her hair, brown with reddish highlights, bunched loosely on top of her head, held in place with a black plastic clip. No makeup, just chapstick burgundy nail polish chipping away. Her phone rests face down on the violet duvet. She holds Snugglepuff's preserved body close to her abdomen with both hands. And she tries, she tries so hard. All right, that's it, that's the story. Um, yeah. Wow, that was uh, so <laughs> so where where do you, I know um, I know you started working on this a while ago. Where did you initially think it was going to go? I know you said it went again. In a different... I, I, it went in a completely different direction. I thought I thought it was going to go in sort of the 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 morality play way, like like a sort of a you know like she gets caught and all this stuff happens. But I didn't want to do that because I feel like that's too. It was too didactic. It was too simplistic. You know. And I, I, so I, I wanted it to just sort of work toward this image and uh, and sort of let it ring out instead, rather than rather than it sort of moralizing at people, you know. And then I was like, okay, well, I can. Um, at the end, you know, I, I I finally finished it this week. I've been working on it off and on for about a year, and I finished it this week when I remembered that you know ever since milan kandera and uh, the, the the unbearable lightness of being it's totally okay for me to sort of break the fourth wall as a narrator and just say look this is what this is about this is what this means um kind of like he did it, it's um he does this wonderful thing in his novels where he's like i thought of this character when i was at a public pool and i saw this woman with her kids and i saw this happening and that's how why i made up this character in this and so uh, i i kind of wanted to go into something where i i break it at the end and, and take it somewhere that is a little bit more unexpected um i, I didn't want that direct one-to-one -one, you know i didn't want it to be a black mirror episode if that makes sense you know uh, <laughs> So that's that's kind of where that that went, and, and then also too um, thematically, I didn't want it to be about. It is partially about our relationship with technology, but I think it's mostly about loneliness and grief. Um, you know, as, as anyone who 
goes through the death of a beloved pet, uh, it's a very difficult and weird thing. And it can, it can definitely do, you know, it can, it, it, you don't know how you will react and you don't know what you are going to do in a situation where, uh, in a situation of loss. And then also, you know, the, the, the biggest, the, the real theme isn't so much the, Hey, we're all hooked on our screens all the time. Cause you know what? I, I don't care about that. Everybody, everybody talks about that. Um, it's more like this thing being a vector for loneliness. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for uh, for reading tonight. And oh, yeah. um yeah, we're doing uh for people who, I know there are people watching us on Facebook too. Yeah. We uh, we're doing something something different virtually every day. Um so tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock we're doing um it's our virtual personal home library tour series. Oh, cool. uh, kind of oh I would love to do that. That would be really yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah I'll, 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 I'll get you some dates. We'll get you on the schedule. That'd be really awesome. Fun. Yeah, it would be really, really fun. Yeah. All right. And, well, uh, yeah, so tomorrow at 2 o'clock, and that's all on our Facebook page for anybody who is, uh, who's watching us right now. But, yeah, awesome story. Well worth the wait. I remember you first telling me about this, so that, that was great. All right. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks a whole lot. All right. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.